Uh, okay, uh, Sarah, you can uh, share your screen. Thanks. Yeah. All right, just a second. Okay. Yeah, okay. Is, can, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, yeah. Okay, so thanks everyone to um, attending for attending this session. My name is Sara Iris Garcia. And I am going to talk uh, about uh, a review of gap filling techniques in time series data. So first of all, um, who am I? So my name is uh, Sara Iris Garcia. I am a, da a data scientist uh, based in Guatemala. I am an active Python community member. I currently uh, I'm the co-lead of Pi Ladies Guatemala City and I'm, on a, um, I'm a chapter of Women in Data Guatemala City as well. And um, I'm also starting a new uh, chapter of Papers We Love in Guatemala City as well. Guatemala for um, if for some that you may not familiar, um, it's located in Latin America, uh, specifically in Central America, we are um, share borders with Mexico. So my first language is Spanish. And I hope uh, that I can be, um, you, you, you can excuse my accent um, because it's not my first language. Um, so yeah, I, I have a, a master's degree in data science and I have more than seven years of experience as a software developer. Um, and I'm, I've been working specifically with machine learning and data science, uh, mostly for um, medical applications specifically in the areas of of um, uh, image recognition. So um, for some of you that, know my, that you are not familiar with uh, medical data, there is also a lot involved with time series. It, um, there's a, there's a, like a whole field for uh, medical image recognition, but as well, we have a lot of time series data. And um, so there's a, like a lot of different types of time series data that I, I want to talk about that specifically in, in a moment, but I'm just, uh, uh, I'm not in this talk, I'm not going to focus on that specifically because I know it's a very narrow um, field. So I'm just going to be uh, talk like the, the simplistic um, techniques in the, in the most um, like simple scenarios, but bear in mind that time series data is one of the most complex uh, fields that you can work on. It's, you, you need to have like um, specifically knowledge about the, the business or the field you're working in. And so I hope that just because I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about these, these techniques, it doesn't mean that there are not more outside and more specifically um, for the data you're, uh, you're working in. So some of these techniques may not be um, the best for your scenario or or type of data but i hope i can with this because it's like it's a very broad uh, topic 
I hope I can cover at least the minimum. So, so yeah, um, this is um, the content I I am hoping to cover due to the time constraint that we have. So first of all, I am planning to uh, talk about linear interpolation, then move to spline interpolation, then simple cumulative and exponential moving average, and Kalman smoothing. If the times uh, allows, if the time allows, then uh, we may uh, we may uh, move forward to talk for um multivariate time series uh gap filling techniques which is a whole new new different topic um and well before it to start if anyone have a question i i encourage you to do so at the end of the talk uh or put it in the chat box and I will um, happily answer uh, the, all the questions that I that I can do for 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 this given time. If not, I will um, share my email at the end of the talk as well, and to to extend the conversation further on time. So, uh, what is a time series? Um, well. Let's start by defining this type of data, type of data, because it's uh, it's a really uh, different type of data. As um, like you have data of image image data, you have data for um, uh, financial data, etc. You also have time series data, which is a, a a different type of data that is identified by the order of observations. So this type of data is a series of observations that is or that are ordered uh, successful uh, successive in time, and this time is equally spaced um, time intervals. So for um, there are a lot of of applications, but of time series. But the main uh, thing that we want to do with uh, time series data is to predict or forecast uh, future values based on this historical data that we have in a certain period period of time. So for this. Uh, uh predictions we have a lot of uh, many uh, many different um, uh, techniques and models but the majority of these models can be successfully applied with um, a time series data that uh, that are um, completed which, which means that it, they don't have any gaps in time. So because of this, uh, these constraints of applying these models to make the predictions or the forecasting, we have to um, we have to present this this time series that that are completed. And in real life scenarios, this is really. Uh, not usual. The usual thing is that we ha we will have um, empty spaces or gaps in our data. So, probably, uh, if for to give you an example, if we are talking about sales data, for instance, uh, of a store, what if uh, what if we have yeah, we have all the daily data in our store in the databases, in the databases. But uh, we may close one day. It's uh, national holidays, for instance, and 
that moment we 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 it, it's not going to be safe in our data so what should we do in this uh, for these cases, or, or for example, now that uh, we have the US presidential elections, do we have this data for only um, um, for, for a specific periods of time? So what if we want to, if we want to forecast a, te a tendency for the voters um, across uh, every year and we have only polls for each uh, for the, uh, every four years so in these cases we we need this uh, the data to be full um, so this is one of the reasons time series is uh, a time series analysis is one of the most difficult um, thing to do in data science and it requires a lot of expertise not only in the matters of data science but also in the in the specific uh, ob uh, object of study and so we we can have uh, a lot of different type series of data and the majority uh, as i said the majority will have um, gaps in this in this um, in, in in these observations, but it's very difficult. It's very different to have a gap in, for instance, in uh, genomics data than gaps in um, temperature, for instance, or. I, I, I don't know, uh, medical observations or, or movement in like in devices that track your movement. So it's very, um, it's very, very different having a gap in one and another application. So for this, for these um, gaps that we will have presented in, in our data, in our data very in mind that it's very dif di different. It will depend on which is your object of, of, of study because if, you're, if your data is generated by um, some instrument, maybe the reason of you having that uh, gaps in the data, maybe because of the, how that instrument works or how is the data being generated? So it's, it's, it's very, um, I just want to um, um, let, it, let that very clearly because it's, uh, it's not just about applying this method that I'm going to talk in every type of data, uh, but it's more like understand why we have these gaps of the in, in the data. So for these observations that are often missing uh, or recorded or um, that, are, that are very common as, as you can see in my slide in sociology, for instance, that has a lot of, of uh, missing data, then we, we have a specific methods and one may be, um, good for one case and another method may not be the best for another case so just yeah i'm just just to clarify that so i was planning to uh work on this like in um lively in a notebook and all that but since the time is a little bit uh constrained um you will have all this uh, all this code uh, in a couple of days in, I, I will share um, the, the address for the repository that uh, it will, will be available with all these codes uh, in a notebook in a couple of days. But for, for just this talk, um, I, I just put here some screenshots. 
So um, as I said, this is gonna be like the very basic, the very simplest scenario. Um, and our data set is gonna be a care sales data set that you can find here. And I'll also, I, I will share that um, in the data in the repository. So this database comprises of two, um, uh, two columns. We have the column of months and the column of sales. So the column of months have all the sales uh, pr uh, produced by, by um, a car sales store in, per month. So we have uh, the summary for each month, how many cars that store sell. And as you can see, if I plot this data, we can see a lot of gaps. If we want to, um, if, if I'm interested in seeing how many cars the store uh, will have based on these records per day, I can see that I have many, many gaps in the data because the data is um, stored by month in a monthly basis. So what should we do in this case? We have very um, uh, sparse data. We have uh, a lot of gaps in here. First, because the data was not intended to be um, um, recorded daily, but monthly. So in this case, um, like one of the first um, and I will say the most easiest approach is to impute in data, or which means to fill the data with a value. Uh, the, the easiest will be to fill um, to fill not not just talking about this data set, but every other data set. If we have an empty, an empty um, value for, for, for a specific period of time, we can fill that value with just imputing zeros or the mean of the values that, that we have uh, in the records or um, yeah, uh, the, yeah, the mean or the average. We can have all these um, very basic methods, but they are also a little bit more complex or more intelligent approaches to do so. One of the simplest of this range of methods is linear interpolation. So linear interpolation is, um, the, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, linear regression, it uh, works the same way. So based on two points, we will, uh, we will uh, be interpolating a value between these two points that are, that are um, spaced in, in, in a specific time. So we have, for instance, uh, the, if we can see here, in our database, in our data set. So we have a month, uh, the first, um, the, uh, the first day, for instance, we can suppose that it, it will be the first day of January and the first day of February. So what if we want to say, we want to, to, to see how many cars uh, we will have be, be sold by the middle of, of like 15 days in the in the month. So we, we because we don't have this data in the database, what how can we approach this problem with linear interpolation? With linear interpolation, we will do based on these two values that we have, the sales on uh, January and the sales on February. So we will put in the uh, in the point that we are want uh, we are trying to fill with 
with a value, we'll, we will be interpolating this based on these two points. And how how do you do, we do that? Uh, we will do that in a linear um, fashion. So this is very uh, very easily to do with uh, uh, in Python, specifically using pandas. It's very easily, um, and as you can see, it's it's only a matter of few. Um, actually just two lines. So first, uh, Pandas is very intelligent to um, resample the data. So because we don't have, uh, as here, we can see, I don't know if it's, okay. So we can see here that we just have the first row is the um, January, of 1960 and then February of 1960. So we want to fill this, our task, like I want to see how many cars are being say, uh, sold per, per day. So I have, first of all, I have to, to change my data set and make a row for each of the periods I, uh, I want to look for. So because I want to see the sales per day, I have to fill by daily basis. So this means that I have to fill between, between each row at least 30 more um, rows in, here, in between. So how do you do that with Python? Well, uh, specifically with pandas, with the function resample. So we have here our data or data set is called DF. We have the column cells here. So because we want to uh, resample, resample our data based on, um, on this, then we, we can just um, call the function. And because it's it's um, a daily, uh, I want the daily records. It's just a matter of putting this one D or even just D in the parameters. And uh, what uh, pandas will do is as you can see here, it will fill all these values, uh, all this row with empty values at the moment, at the moment of running this. So the second step after we we have um, we have a, um, grow our data set the way we want, the second step is to interpolate, fill these values in the cells column, because this is going to be um, uh, creating new rows. How? can we fill with which values we can fill those rows. So with the method, another method uh, of pandas, uh, interpolate, you can easily, as you can see, it's just one line, uh, you can easily interpolate those values by linear, um, using linear interpolation and the key is to set the parameter method equal to linear. And you can have a look for the documentation. There's a lot of different, um, different methods that pandas um, and SciPy as well can, um, can work with. And also for the resample function, you can have, if I wanted to, for instance, have a record every two days, I can do that simply by putting 2D instead of 1D. Or five every five days, it will be 5 and D. So um, just you can see how easily it is. And if we plot the newly generated data, we can see that we have now a more field data. There 
uh, there are no more empty gaps as compared with the original data, data that we can see here. Now, um, now we have these records filled in the way I wanted, which was um, daily data. So um, the next is spline interpolation. And these, all these methods, like linear interpolation, and there's a, like a whole um, range of, of uh, linear interpolation methods. I, I was, I just uh, talk about that specifically, but um, as we have linear interpolation, we also have um, even polynomial uh, interpolation and degrees of polynomial interpolation. So one of these is the spline interpolation, which is a form of uh, the interpolation with um, which has the difference that it's uh, like a polynomial um, interpolation. So what it does is um, with with uh, polynomial interpolation instead of just um, inter uh, making their interpolation in a linear um, linear way, we can also have um, interpolation in, uh, in polynomial way. And spline is a slightly different um, uh, interpolation from polynomial interpolation. And the difference is, is that it's um, it can has um, the ability of overcome one um, one problem that is that with uh, polynomial interpolation you have to calculate the derivatives and that makes um, the derivatives grow as more data you have but you can ha overcome this problem using spline interpolation. And this is especially, um, especially good, although it has its, its limitation, it's especially good for time series when you don't have a strong trend. Um, a trend is like this one that you can, you can see a pattern that will be a trend. And, and um, this is uh, an example of one of the difference a visual example of one, of one of the difference between linear and one of the types of spline interpolation, which is cubic spline interpolation. As you can see here, um, our linear data is more like, um, it's not very smooth at, at, at all. That's one of the uh, sorry, that's one of the characteristics of linear interpolation or linear functions. And with cubic spline, we can see that um, the edges are more uh, are smoother. So if if our data, um, just ju just to summarize, if our data is uh, behaving more in a linear way, the best method to use is linear interpolation but if we see that our um, data behaves more in a, in a, um, in a uh, non-linear way uh, we can use other methods and one method can be spline interpolation um, another Ah, well, I, I didn't even talk about um, the how do you do this in, in, um, in Python. So in Python is as well using the same interpolate method that uh, we just talk with the linear interpolation. The, all, the, the only difference is to set the parameter method to spline and you can have a look at all the documentation is, is uh, the documentation is very good and has a lot of of different uh, parameters uh, different functions that you can try 
And the only difference with the spline is that you can uh, you can set an order. You have to set an order. Um, so for this, um, the order is three. And there's a, a mathematical uh, meaning for this that you can also have a look at the documentation. But I just want you to see all the um, all the the data that was generated. You can see here. I just I'm not sure if I. So if if you see the difference here with the data uh, generated by, li by linear interpolation, what it does is that this is um, like here. We have we have the first row as uh, six thousand five hundred and fifty, and the second row is eight thousand seven hundred and twenty-eight. Is the next record. So what? What linear interpolation does is um, fill the values that are here that uh, in such a way that the, the records that are more close to the second record here are will, will be closer to the, this value. And that you can, you can see here, the values are growing in, uh, in a linear way. So for um, spline interpolation, we have here that the values are more um, uh, are more like growing smoother, and and this is uh, how we can maybe the the screen doesn't show this uh, with much of difference. Um, how these two linear interpolation and, and spline interpolation um, are different uh, uh, graphically, but there is there is a difference in here. Uh, so the spline interpolation is a little bit smoother that we cannot see here, but I will share this notebook uh, as I said uh, later. So um, there's another very um, easily way, uh, easily method, um, very wide used. The, the name is simple moving average, which is, uh, it, use, it uses a uh, sliding windows to take um, the average over a number of uh, periods. And what it, uh, well, there, there's like a, a lot of different type of moving average, but this, as the name says, simple moving average is because all of um, all of the um, the values, uh, interpolated values, are equally weighted over um, over the mean of the periods of. Uh, of the cert of the certain amount of period that you choose to calculate. So for this, it's also very very easily to compute with pandas. Uh, if uh, you can use the function rolling, and you you have to set two parameters, which is windows a uh, window and the parameter mean period. So uh, the parameter window means that how many records you have you you want to um, take into account for the for computing the next one, and the minimum period is uh, is I believe is very straightforward to understand. It's just a minimum period to consider, and then we can after after applying this rolling uh, function. Uh, we can we can compute uh, any other on top of this any any other function. In this case, I'm using mean, but you can use the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, etc. And you can also have a look at the documentation uh, because it's it, it's a very um, well written, has a lot of uh, detail on it. So I just want you to see here what I did was I created a new column just for the sake of, of having of seeing the differences. Um, so I created a new column for the simple moving average um, 
value, the uh, value generated by simple moving average. And we can see compare here with linear interpolation, how, um, how different are these values gener uh, that were generated. So um, for this, I said here that the minimum period to consider the moon simple moving average is one. So in the first, um, for the first uh, value, it's gonna be the same because I just said here. And the second value is gonna be like the sum of these two divided by these two and so on and so on. So we can here, um, I just plotted the, the values uh, that, that I generated by linear interpolation, which is like the, our, it's gonna be our, like our baseline. And the simple moving average in green, just to see the difference visual, visually, um, how is, how are different are the values generated. And we can see here that by simple moving average, we, hear, we see here that all these spikes that we, hear, we see here in linear interpolation here, that is our, ba our baseline, uh, with simple moving average, it doesn't appear to react as um, as fast as we we may want. So these these spikes are being override um, basically because how it how simple moving average works. So another uh, another um, method to move like um, a little bit beyond this is cumulative moving average. average. So in, with cumulative, cumulative moving average, we have uh, the same, um, and, and if just, I don't know how much I'm in time, but uh, I think I'm, I'm still in time. So uh, with cumulative moving average, we do the same. We, we have here the same uh, data set and we apply uh, this expanding, uh, the expanding function over the column cells, which is the column that we are, um, uh, we are want to um, generate a new value from. And with this expanding uh, function, we can apply as well, another um, another aggregated function that can in this in this example is the mean, but it can also be standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, etc. Um, so just for visual explanation, I have here our sales data generated uh, generated by linear interpolation then the data generated by, by simple moving average and the cumulative moving average values. So we have here that we can see here a difference with um, simple moving average and cumulative moving average um, on the fifth, over the fifth um, uh, row. So this, this is a little bit, different of simple moving average in the way that um, we, we um, compute the values. And, and what we do here is compute based on all the record, not just like in, in, in a number Hi, of specified. Hi, Sarah, sorry for, for, for interval. Uh, since the day ta uh, session's time is, is running out, uh, it would be quick if you can uh, do a quick uh, do a quick wrap up in one to two minutes, and then we okay. will see uh, any uh, Q and A quick quick quickly. Yeah, because the okay. list is starting soon. Thank okay, you. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. So um, uh, just moving forward, uh, in a minute. We will see here the exponential moving average, we, uh, which we can also uh, apply by this one line of code using as well um, Python. 
uh, pandas. And just for um, like uh, a visual differentiation, you can see here of all these, the, the three different methods that I just talked about. And all of these has their drawbox. And, uh, 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 but those drawbox will be um, actually good in, depending in the, the, the case, the, your specific case. And I also wanted to talk about Kalmanian smoothing but I don't think it will be possible to, 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 to time we have, but it's also very easily to apply using the PyCalman module and that you can easily install it via pip and import um, like, like this way. And what uh, Kalman is moving is, is, uh, is uh, um, um, a method that you can use based on Kalman filters. And here I just put the code of how to apply common smoothing in in pandas in in sorry in pi common using pi pi common and as you can see it's just five lines of code so um, just um, here if you have any questions I am open to um, answer all and you can. Um, you can write uh, um, a further question at my personal email, following me here in Twitter. And this notebook will be available in two days in this address at my repository in GitHub, if anyone is interested in the actual code. Thank you, Sarah. So may I ask the participants, uh, if you have any questions, please leave your questions in the chat first in in half minutes yeah so she can check it out and and answer as uh at once so we will wait for half minute to see uh any incoming questions Five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, okay. We don't have uh, any questions yet. So, if you have uh, any questions about uh, uh, the data series, you you can uh, email to uh, Sarah, and uh, and you can also contact her uh, uh, in Twitter as well. Thanks, uh, thank you Sarah, everyone okay. for attending yeah. this uh, talk. Thank you. And yeah, yeah. I have, uh, I just, yeah, I have this, um, I have put it there, my, the URL of the, of the repository. Yeah. This. Yeah. We will call, we will also call it a uh, slide from a uh, speaker okay, uh, uh, after this conference as well. So we, we will distribute uh, the presentation file to uh, on our website. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So thanks, thanks again. Yeah, thanks again, Sarah. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Let me share my screen first. Uh, okay, this is the last session and the key of sessions of the uh, day one. Um, the topic is uh, production uh, machine learning monitoring principal patterns and techniques by the uh, uh, Ali Andu uh, Sassandu. Yeah, so I, so I passed, so I,
pass the uh, screen sharing to him. Oh. Yeah, you can now share your screen. Yeah, thank you. So I pass the floor to uh, Ali Andrew. Thank you, Sami. All right. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so I think um, um, we're going to be delving into an uh, interesting topic. So as Sami mentioned, uh, today we're going to be covering production machine learning monitoring principles, patterns, and techniques. Uh, it's going to be both a, a theory-based uh, um, session together with a set of hands-on uh, examples that we're going to be covering. Uh, there's a, quite a lot to cover in this presentation, so we're going to have to rush through uh, quite a few uh, key uh, pieces. As uh, Sami mentioned, you're able to leave uh, any questions on uh, the chat, and I will be able to answer them either as I go or at the end of the session uh, so we can cover them. So a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Alejandro Saucedo. Uh, I am engineering director at Selden, uh, chief scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI, and a member at large at the ACM. Uh, to tell you a bit more about Selden, uh, we are an open source machine learning deployment uh, company. We, we uh, built one of the most popular uh, Kubernetes-based uh, machine learning deployment frameworks. Uh, and we're gonna be using Selden, uh, Selden Core for the examples today. Um, and the Institute is a research center that focuses in developing uh, standards and tools uh, for the responsible, responsible uh, development and operation of machine learning systems. And we're part of the uh, Linux Foundation, uh, which uh, allows us to contribute from a very practical perspective. But today we're going to be covering some of the motivations of why should we care about ML monitoring, uh, some of the principles uh, to achieve efficient and uh, reliable monitoring, uh, some key patterns uh, that have been abstracted uh, to the machine learning uh, world, uh, and then a set of hands-on examples that we're going to be switching over. So uh, the slides can be found uh, in this link, uh, and then um, throughout the presentation, you will see a set of links below the slide where you'll be able to um, uh, test uh, the open source examples yourselves. Um, so let's set the, set the scene. And uh, we all are aware that even without the machine learning context, production systems and more specifically production machine learning, learning systems are hard. Um, for us, we, we uh, interact with uh, contexts that require and that involve thousands of machine learning models, which you can imagine uh, the uh, heterogeneity when it comes to specialized hardware uh, to complex dependency graphs for data and uh, data flow, uh, the compliance requirements, the reproducibility demands, lineage, metadata, etc. Uh, and I have actually a talk uh, online that you can check, particularly in this in this area of machine learning operations. And uh, I guess now it's not longer popular demand, but uh, we are now aware that the life cycle of the model doesn't finish once it's deployed. If anything, it only begins once it's fully trained, right? It's deployed, it's potentially retrained, it's probably superseded by a better performing model, um, it's promoted to different uh, environments. So ultimately, there's quite a lot of uh, 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 time that goes uh, once the model has been deployed and quite a lot of best practices that need to be involved throughout its life cycle. And more specifically, what we're going to be looking at today is we're going to be taking a model. Uh, we're going to be trying to take a very simple machine learning use case as we're going to be covering very complex uh, uh, terminology around the machine learning space. Uh, we're going to be sending some predictions to this model that, ha that is going to be deployed as a microservice to see what can be monitored. We're going to be sending feedback to this model to be able to get some more advanced statistical monitoring. And then we're going to be delving into more specific uh, uh, terminology like explainability as a, as a uh, architectural pattern, outlier detection, and drift detection. And as I mentioned, we're going to be taking you know the hello world of machine learning, the iris classifier. It's going to be um, a simple sort of underlying machine learning model, but to be able to focus on the overarching uh, terminology that we're going to be using. So specifically, we're going to have an input, which is an array of uh, four numbers, 
uh, floats, and then an output, which is basically a class uh, from three classes. That's basically what we're going to be interacting with. We're going to be interacting with this as a uh, black box in a way, primarily as we care primarily of the inputs and outputs. And this is why uh, the premise is set this way. Uh, in order for us to be able to deploy this model, uh, we are assuming that there has already been a data science uh, process to uh, identify the best performance, best data distribution uh, to use to train this model. And in this case, we're gonna just be taking a simple model, training it, and then taking this artifact and deploying that, right? What that really looks like is specifically, uh, you know, getting the iris data set, then getting a train test split, and then training a model, which in this case, it's just a logistic regression or a random forest. It doesn't really matter at, uh, uh, for our specific use case, which then allow us to actually perform inference. So in an unseen data point, we would get the prediction then we would be able to actually export and persist that model, in this case, as a pickle. This is the pickle that we're going to be deploying. Uh, and ultimately, this is what we're gonna be using uh, around in this presentation. So the way that we're going to be uh, containerizing and deploying it is using Selden. Uh, we're going to be able to leverage directly the artifact or to create a Python wrapper that then will become a fully fledged microservice using these tools. So it converts it from a either artifact or, or, or Python class into an actual microservice where the inputs and outputs can be the data that you send uh, to this model as a prediction. So the input would be an input array and the prediction would be one of these three classes. But now let's see what is the anatomy of a production deployed machine learning stack, the end-to-end -end area. And in this case, you have the training data, the artifact store, uh, basically the persistence of the state of your production environment and the inference data. So for the first step, you have your experimentation. This is basically the model training, um, your high parameter tuning. It uses the input training data and it creates an artifact, right? This is what we just did. We exported an artifact. Then you're able to deploy that programmatically, right? So that means that with some continuous integration process that would be in charge of, you know, uh, creating that artifact, putting it in an object store and deploying it so that then once you deploy it, it can go into your environments, your respective development environments, production environments as a real-time model, batch model. Uh, with Solon Core, we're going to be using it to enable us to deploy this model into a Kubernetes cluster. And then every single input and output data, as you would with another microservice, would be stored in an elastic Prometheus data store or a metrics or logs data store, which ultimately allows you not just to have persistence, but also to be able to use for then again, training data. So what are the monitoring metrics that are involved in production ML systems? So you have the usual microservice metrics, performance metrics and tracing. You have more specific machine learning metrics, statistical performance, um, you have things like outliers and drift detection. We're going to cover that, what that means in more detail. And you have explainability tools that often have, are discussed in an offline um, analytical aspect. But in this case, we're going to be discussing it in a monitoring production um, uh, real-time or semi-real-time basis. But these are the core things that we're going to be delving in, in this topic. So let's start with the first part. And I'm sure that many of our fellow you know, programmers in this, in this audience are gonna be more familiar with this, performance monitoring. And the principles are being able to monitor your microservice on its running underlying performance. So this is to identify potential bottlenecks, runtime red flags, uh, malfunctions, or identify something preemptively before, some, before it actually goes wrong. And then of course, being able to debug and diagnose unexpected performance. And in this case, it's in the context of our machine learning model. Right, our machine learning model that we deployed crashes, behaves uh, incorrectly, it has major throughputs, uh, uh, spikes, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically the things that we wanna look at. And what that, that looks in more practical terms, this is things like request per second, latency per request, CPU memory data utilization, distributed tracing. So to go back to our, to our example, what we can do now is take that model artifact and first of all, deploy it into our Kubernetes cluster basically pointing to that model artifact using Selden to convert it into a microservice. Now we actually have a microservice that we can send requests 
and receive predictions of exactly the same model that we deployed. We can see that our model is now deployed and we can actually send data for it to basically process, right? So we're gonna send now some data, it's sending requests and then is receiving the predictions. Uh, ultimately, what we're now gonna see is we're gonna start seeing some um, you know, requests per second. We're gonna start seeing some insights on the latency. Um, ultimately, we will also be able to see the performance uh, in our cluster sort of changing. We can see that the CPU utilization uh, is now being in use. And this is the usual stuff that you would see in a microservice, right? This is not, not something new, but ultimately if the model crashes or has a, a wrong prediction, we would be able to see this in the number of success requests or the number of uh, 400s or, or 500 requests, right? This is basically the number of errors that, that, that potentially appear uh, in, in our system, right? So this is basically some of the core components. Uh, now we can see that there's seven requests per second, right? So this is basically the usual things that you would see in your, in your normal microservice, right? So let's actually pause that um, and let's have a look deeper. So the patterns that you would see here is what we just said. Take your model artifacts, deploy them as a microservice, and then uh, extract the same similar insights that you would for your um, uh, usual microservices, metrics, logs, tracing, etc. But now let's go one level deeper. Statistical monitoring principles, right? What, what is the statistical monitoring? This is basically monitoring specific to statistic, statistical properties of the machine learning performance. So this is things like calculating using the corrected labels so that we can actually understand how the model is performing compared to how it was performing when we trained it, right? This means that if it performed really well during training, we would deploy it, see on scene data, but until we provide corrected and uh, correct labels, we can then see the actual performance. This is things like accuracy, precision recall, and can be used to benchmark either models in real time, one against another one as A-B tests, and it can also be used for evaluating in a long-term perspective. We will see more advanced uh, concepts uh, in a bit. This is key, and this is one of the core insights that we sort of like extended within Selden um, so that it is used as a first-class citizen so that you can have your models almost out of the box with these components. And what this, this looks like in practice is things that you would often see as a data scientist, true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives, which can be converted into accuracy, precision, recall, specificity, and then even uh, allowing you to have more specialized metrics like KL divergence, et cetera. But I mean, ultimately what this is, you know, even though we're seeing something very specific to machine learning, this just basically means machine learning specific to the use, use case that you are interacting with. In this case, it's machine learning, right? But ultimately it's abstracting some of this core patterns that we would see into uh, reusable uh, components. And this is important for us because we deal with thousands of models, right? We can't have every single thing, every single deployed model rasp, uh, 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 wrapped in a flask wrapper with an unstandardized interface with super specialized metrics. We can't expect all of our DevOps and SREs to be machine learning experts as well, right? And from that same perspective, let's not delve into architectural patterns. And this is what we, what we uh, coined as the statistical monitoring pattern, the statistical feedback pattern. And this is basically, if you remember, we deployed our model. What, what does our model do right now? It sends inference data and returns a prediction. But what can we do beyond that? We can actually make it such that it doesn't only send the data, but it stores the inference data with the response, the prediction, right? And now when we send the correct label, where we tell the model, hey, that ID that you sent previously was wrong. Here's the correct label, or it was correct. Here's the correct label. Then we can have another microservice which listens to that feedback and is able to compare that old inference request with that incoming feedback and then be able to provide real time performance metrics of how the model is running. In this case, is it, is it actually performing well or is it not? What, if, what does that look like in practice? Well, let's have a look. So in this case, instead of just sending a bunch of requests, we're gonna be sending a bunch of requests and storing the request ID. And we're gonna be using that request ID to do what? To basically send the correct labels, right? So as we finish sending this request ID and we, we are gonna be seeing some 
you know, actual spike in the in the predictions, you know, 4.2 now. Um, we are now going to be able to not send predictions, but send corrections. Send, hey, hey, model, here are the correct labels. And this is the respective IDs to where it should reside, right? So what I'm saying is these are the correct labels, and this is the ID of the relevant uh, request. So we're going to be sending corrections. Um, and in this case, we don't want to just send corrections because that would be a bit boring because uh, I already have the model with very good performance. We want to send something that shows the skew. And in this case, we're going to send the randomized correct labels, which means that they're not correct. So the model is going to get a lot of things wrong. And what that's going to allow us to do is to just basically start seeing some uh, divergence in the performance, right? And, and we want to see a bit faster divergence. So we don't want to wait, you know, half a second every time that it sends a request. We want to make it a little bit faster. Um, and what we can see now is that in the performance of, of the model, we're going to start seeing some uh, uh, sort of like the uh, on, on on its performance. And then going back to the use case, if you remember, what do we have deployed? We have deployed a model that predicts one of three classes, right? So here, not only we can see the total uh, accuracy, precision, and recall, but we can see the actual breakdown on a per class basis. And we can see that class two, class one, and class zero have different accuracy, precision, and recall, right? And why is this important? I mean, for flowers, maybe not as much. But for real humans, being able to identify your accuracy, precision, and recall for protected features like, uh, like gender or ethnicity allows you to identify whether there is potential inherent bias in the real-time deployed model that is performing inference on real data, right? So if you have models that are actually having impact on humans' lives, you need to make sure that this is in accordance with the distribution of the data that you saw on your training when the model was being created. And this is actually something really cool, right? Because not only you're getting an overview of metrics and monitoring, but you're getting something that is not just specific to machine learning, but specific to a use case that makes it particularly useful uh, for not only the machine learning practitioners, but also the, the, the specific, uh, um, uh, operational uh, 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 stakeholders that would be managing the process in itself, right? So here we can see, hey, we're starting to see some, you know, bad performance of the model. So somebody should do something about it, right? So that's where you can actually set alerts and you can notify individuals to say, hey, this model is not performing well. Maybe it needs some retraining, right? So that's the key thing. Now let's pause that because, um, you know, we don't want to we don't want to have business uh, finding out that our model is performing bad. Um, and let's move to the next part, explainability, monitoring. So what's explainability? Um, so explainability is um, human interpretable insights for the model's behavior. So your model predicted class three. Uh, explainability is to be able to understand and explain why did it predict class three? Be and this is, this is important in use cases where you are having uh, direct impact into um, uh, potential users that may be detrimental or uh, of high risk for that individual, right? Things like credit risk uh, predictions, or um, as we have seen in some uh, potentially high profile, uh, bad practices like sentencing prediction. And it's important primarily now because we now are starting to see an adoption of black box complex models like deep neural networks. So introducing interpretability techniques only allows you to leverage more of these advanced uh, 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 techniques. So this is use case specific explainability capabilities, justifiable uh, interpretations of, of, of model uh, per, per, per predictions. Uh, and then of course, to identify key metrics such as trust scores or statistical performance thresholds that can be used not just to explain on an analytical perspective, but also used on a monitoring basic as a, as a, as a real time uh, perspective. And then enabling for more complex machine learning techniques as we mentioned. So the terms that you tend to see in the machine learning explainability space is whether it is local for a single prediction or global for the entire data set, whether it is 
black box interacting with just the inputs and outputs or white box actually opening up the model and seeing what's inside the type of task classification regression the data type tabular images etc cetera, etc cetera. and ultimately for this we also require an architectural pattern and why do we introduce patterns the reason why is back to the same premise if we have thousands of models with hundreds of explainers hundreds of metric servers we don't want to have to deal or our DevOps and SREs and IT managers and platform leads shouldn't have to deal with hyper-specialized um, individual components that require a uh, high amount of um, uh, machine learning expertise in order to monitor in a baseline perspective. And this introduces the ability to have infrastructural components that can be abstracted and uh, scaled. Within Selden, we've abstracted this into cloud native patterns, uh, which often is referred in the Kubernetes space as uh, custom resource definitions. So this is basically um, abstractions for the Kubernetes uh, world where you can deploy an explainer, right? You can deploy a model, you can deploy a metric server, et cetera, et cetera. So you only deal with these components and you deal with those perspectives. And this is important because, you know, we're talking about the monitoring of our models, but this is a microservice as well. And this has monitoring metrics as well. So from this perspective, just to cover in detail, when you send that request to the model, you get an inference response. When you send a request to the explainer server, you don't just get an inference response. The explainer takes that input data, it reverse engineers the models by interacting with it, and then returns an, inf an explanation, right? And what that looks like in practice is if we actually deploy an explainer. So here we can train an explainer, an anchor tabular that tells us our more uh, strong predictive uh, features. We can use an actual input. In this case, it's just basically this first index. And we can explain it, right? So this tells us that actually from this explanation, the core most impactful uh, pieces is the petal width, which I assume is this one, and the sepal width, which I assume is this one. And if they are over this terms, it would actually converge into that prediction, right? So this is type of explanations that allow you to go back to your use case and explain them. Similar to the model, we can export the explainer, right? And that exported explainer can be deployed as an actual microservice component as part of that model that we have deployed, right? So we can deploy that specific uh, microservice. We now have a deployed explainer. And similar to how we just did it over there, um, that we you know, sent a request to the model and got a response, we can actually send a request to the explainer and then get a response, right? We just got a response and we can print it. And the response is the same, right? This is actually a RESTful request that we just sent to a microservice that actually we can see uh, in here as metrics, right? We can see the, the explainer, although it will take a little bit to actually register that, that input prediction. Um, and ultimately from that same perspective, you know, we can actually see uh, that we could monitor the explainer. Look, our our model is still uh, you know performing worse and worse. Uh, uh, even even we stop the the actual predictions. So that that shows you the power of not just the machine learning techniques that we're using, but also the power of the architectural patterns that we're introducing. And just for the last uh, remaining um, you know three to to five minutes, I'm going to cover the last few components, which is the outlier and drift monitoring principles. This is basically being able to detect anomalies or being able to detect drift in data. We'll see what that actually looks like in practice. Outlier detection, basically if you have data that doesn't fit the distribution of the type of data that you're seeing or drift that you're seeing perhaps in certain windows of the processed inference data, uh, divergence that may flag into some uh, mal performance in your, in your deployment. This can be uh, on scope, input versus output, it can be supervised or unsupervised, and it can still be for classification, regression, etc. From a pattern perspective, this is slightly different to what we've seen. We still have our deployed model that receives an input data and returns a res an inference response. But for the outlier detector, what it can do is it can listen through this, uh, you know, cloud events, uh, eventing infrastructure, which we're not going to cover in much detail. It can actually listen to the same inference data that goes through the model, it can do an assessment of whether the data is in distribution or not with a set of uh, algorithms that you can try in, what, in some of the examples that we actually link um, using our open source tool Alibi. Um, you're, you're gonna be able to actually test how all of this uh, fits together. 
And this basically stores whether the data is an outlier or not. So then when you are able to look into the data of your input request, you're able to know whether that request had a particular outlier or you can set up uh, more specific uh, uh, alerts that are relevant to that. And specific to this, we also have drift detection and drift detection is slightly different to outlier. It still listens to the inference data, but instead of acting on each data point, it actually acts on a tumbling or sliding window of data and it identifies whether there, there is a drift that is within that uh, specific set of uh, window. And if there is, again, it sends the metrics so that you can configure your relevant alerts and notify respective individuals. Again, you have a broad number of examples, you know, with our Seldon Core and Alibi tools, you know, we have um, a lot of uh, examples and contributors. If you uh, find an algorithm that is not implemented, please let us know and we'll be able to also have a look at it. There is an extra note where I'm not gonna be delving into a bit more into much detail, but adversarial detectors is also a key component, which we also uh, have adopted. This is basically to be able to identify potential adversarial attacks and more specifically adversarial examples. This is basically uh, modifications of input data that are added statistical noise that end up uh, uh, predicting uh, something that a malicious uh, stakeholder may want to. Right, so this is often used in the cell driverless car where you can have a stop sign with some statistical noise that could cause issues. And of course, there is an architectural pattern for the adversarial detectors that is also slightly different. We can try all of these things um, you know, in, in the open source repo. And you know, it may be worth an extra note that it doesn't really stop there. As you would know with most programmers, we love abstractions and we love adding abstractions on top of our abstractions. And similar to these patterns, you can actually have ensembles on top of your architectures. Similar to how I was saying that you can have an outlier detector acting upon a model, you can also have an outlier detector acting upon a metric server. So maybe you can actually detect things like drift on your accuracy, drift on your precision, drift on your latency, on your request per second. So you can actually have much more complex components. And that's why it's important to you know, introduce the management infrastructure around this, right? Right now, if we actually bring up the machine learning model, it's a tiny, tiny thing inside of somewhere across these hundreds of microservices. And it's important because of those reasons. So with that said, I've covered most of the key things. Uh, actually, I covered all of the key things. We delved into the motivations for machine learning monitoring, the principles for efficient monitoring, uh, some of the core patterns, that you can adopt in your uh, production infrastructure and a hands-on example that you can try yourself and actually four or five different hands-on examples that we covered that you can try yourself as Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and again, so the slides are in this link, bit.ly slash real-time ML. You can find all the links as well there. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions, more than happy to take them. Otherwise, please feel free uh, to send them over uh, through Twitter or email. Um, so with that, I'll pause there and uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, over to you, Sami. Uh, thank you, Ali. Andrew. So with, uh, so may I ask the participants, if you have any uh, questions, please type in chat or, or you can unmute your mic to ask. So we will wait for uh, half minutes to see any uh, incoming questions. So five, four, three, two, one, five, four, three, two, one. So it seems no incoming questions. Yeah. Thanks again, and thanks Ali, Andrew again. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Hey. 
Go ahead. Yes, um, I tried the Bitly link. It seems that the Google Drive is not uh, the permission. It's not um, for everyone. Yeah, the Bitly uh, um, real time ML. Yeah, so I have it here open and I'm pretty sure uh, I changed it. So maybe uh, you will have to log in. Oh, I have uh, to log in. Yeah, oh, you are logged in. Okay, so I'll have a look. Uh, but okay, for now, you. I'll share I'll, I'll share the link on the chat. Uh, yep. I'll, I'll share the link, uh, direct link on the chat. Uh, yep. And um, yeah, I'll be able to have a look and make sure that I'll just... Uh, reopen it yeah oh, okay yep. i can see people jo jumping in now cool yeah yep, thank you it's, it's a great talk thank you okay okay so any other questions from the audience Fifth. Three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. Okay, first, first Ali and Jun again. So we hope to see you, to meet you uh, again soon in Hong Kong. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully soon. Thank you very much, Sami. <laughs> and uh, thank you like always for such great conferences and uh, enjoy everybody. Yeah. So we will have a wrap up. So thanks for everyone to attend uh, uh, today uh, sessions. So I would like to thank our sponsor, uh, Code for Health, um, Microsoft, uh, my SQL, and also thanks our uh, our sixteen uh, speakers. Uh, some of them present today, and, and we still have a. Uh, uh, 10 more speaker will be presents tomorrow in English and in Cantonese. And we first for our volunteer as well. So uh, uh, some of some of them uh, working on marketing and social network and some of them working on the uh, uh, design and finance and the uh, program as well. And I would like to also thank our proposals uh, Western Committee, uh, Gavin, uh, Scotty, and Yang Gan Kim. Uh, so uh, uh, if you have uh, something to share on, on your social network or board, please, uh, please also use the hashtag uh, PyConHK and PyConHK2020. And uh, also after the uh, the conference, please also uh, fill the post conference uh, feedback form, so you can uh, you can scan this QR code or uh, go to a uh, bit dot uh, ly, PyConch K twenty feedback. And also another one of promotion again, we still have a twenty uh, T shirt. So if you would like to purchase uh, additional t-shirt, uh, please uh, email to us at uh, PyCon at PyCon.hk. So, uh, so tomorrow we have uh, another one of the uh, English uh, session as well. Uh, we have uh, four English uh, community sessions. So it will, uh, the, the keynote sessions for the English chat will be about uh, uh, building a uh, production uh, website uh, for the PyCon APAD this year. So uh, the uh, PyCon APAD lead, uh, actually the um, PyCon Malaysia team will tell us uh, how they uh, build, it, build their production website in four day only because, because I learned that they found, they, they look for someone to uh, help them to uh, to the, to build the website, but but it is low, so 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 they they have um, do some alternative, and also uh, J A A S fingers, um, Michael Python to uh, develop uh, embedded a uh, GUI 
using LCD, and also the, the uh, West API and Palm with a fast API. So this one is also highly recommended by our wedding committee. And in the uh, afternoon, we will have uh, one of uh, Cantonese uh, presentations, which starting from uh, PySpark. Uh, we need is uh, will will present from from another part of the <laughs> world. He will present. Uh, she will present from uh, from from Bay Area. And also we have we'll have a COVID lighting chatbot with Python. So uh, we also have a half a half half a sheet her one. And uh, Joe Django. And the uh, last one at the uh, Canonist chat will be at uh, the keynote sessions. Uh, it will be a about uh, 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 using machine learning to do the uh, 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 sign language uh, recognition translator. So it's a very interesting uh, topic. So um, also we will have a uh, short coaching sessions after all the presentations and I will talk about uh, quickly about the uh, Python Hong Kong and Python and the local Python community in Cantonese. So that is, so this is the end of um, of today uh, conference. So we will see you again tomorrow. And, um, and uh, so you can use the uh, another soon link, uh, it give you the third one, the third link. Okay, so if you have uh, any difficulty with the soon uh, tomorrow, please uh, contact, contact us uh, through the email, also to, uh, email to PyCon at PyCon HK. Okay, so see you tomorrow and enjoy your dinner. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you everyone.